morning, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Jeff White. Uh, I'm the interim CEO at Copley Hospital. I'll tell you a little bit more on my, myself in the next few minutes. Uh, to my left is Deb Durain, who's the CFO at Copley. And to my right is Dr. Don Dupuis, who's the Chief Medical Officer at Copley. So we will be the primary uh, presenters today. But uh, I, I want to call your attention that we have a number of supporters in the, in the audience. Kyle Slahetkar is our board chair who's there in the audience. We have a number of our active staff physicians and retired physicians. Uh, Dr. John Macy is currently chief of orthopedics and will be available for any questions about our robust orthopedic practice. We have a number of members of our uh, management team and, uh, and there may be other people who are trickling in as some thought that this program was going to begin at 9.15, but we love an early start. So let me give you uh, our slide number one, uh, an overview of our, some of our leadership changes. So uh, 2000, fiscal year 2019 has been a, an unusually a challenging year at Cotley. Uh, the, our long time uh, Chief Financial Officer Rasul Rangavez died suddenly in December of last year, which left an enormous uh, hole in our Copley team and Copley community. Very fortunately, uh, he had worked diligently on succession planning over the years, and so Deb Durain was able to uh, be promoted and step in and become our Chief Financial Officer uh, early this spring. So this will be her, I believe, her first uh, full-time presentation to the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, Dr. Brian Huber, uh, one of the founders of Mansfield Orthopedic, was unfortunately diagnosed in, in January with, with cancer, and he has been fighting a courageous and diligent battle uh, with his disease since that time. I had a chance to chat with him last week. He is he has a positive spirit, but he has a he has a, a diligent battle to fight with his disease. We do not anticipate he'll be back until early in 2020. Uh, very fortunately, his five colleagues at Mansfield Orthopedics have have stepped up immensely to attempt to fill his, his gap, see our patients, and keep our service moving forward uh, nicely. Um, in, in, in March of uh, this year, I got a call from Vera Jones, our Chief uh, Operating Officer, uh, on a Sunday evening while I was enjoying a martini, um, indicating that, uh, that Copley was in the need of an interim CEO. I have been retired for uh, since 2013, um, but I relented and came and met with the board leadership, the medical staff leadership, and the management team. And so, I, I come out of six years of retirement to uh, to accept this job as the interim CEO. I had a 46-year career in healthcare, 25 working in hospitals in Maine and New Hampshire, was CEO of two community hospitals. And then my 21 years as a consultant at Helms & Company, I had multiple opportunities to work throughout northern New England. I know the, the Vermont landscape very well. Um, I was the, my last job before I retired was the, as the interim CEO of Grace Cottage Hospital in Townsend, Vermont. So I, I was able to present their budget in the fall of, uh, or the summer of 2013 to this board. So I'm not unfamiliar with the process. And the other major change in our community is, as you may know, uh, Copley does not employ any of the primary care physicians. All of our current primary care physicians are employed by uh, community health services like Memorial Valley, known as Cheslev. And they had a, a, a 
number of changes in calendar 18 and, and resulting in Scott McRae joining them in the fall of, of, of last year as their full-time CEO. Scott and I have been meeting weekly. Uh, we, we understand the importance of forming a, a close and independent uh, community collaborative. So it's been a year of, of some significant changes. Uh, our tagline at Copley is exceptional care, community focused. Uh, we will, throughout our presentation, you will hear more about that because we, we believe deeply in, in those, uh, those phrases. Copley, um, perhaps more so than other hospitals in Vermont, uh, has had uh, four years of, of uh, financial challenges. Uh, this, we will end uh, FY19 with our fourth year in a row of operating losses. Um, I'm old school enough to remember the phrase, no margin, no mission. It's, it's difficult to uh, plan for the future when you cannot uh, generate a uh, operating margin. Nonprofit is a tax status, not an operating status. So we presented and will clarify for you a, uh, what we believe is a reasonable uh, FY20 budget with the with the objective of improving our financial health. Uh, I believe strongly in Copley, uh, team has believed strongly in uh, strategic uh, cost reductions. Uh, it's, when we're balancing revenue and against costs, we have far less control over revenue because of payroll mix, because of demographics, because of the uncertainties of, of the the outside economy, but we do have the opportunity to, to manage very efficiently and control our costs, and you'll hear more about that in the, in the slides that follow. We, we need to, uh, we have complied with the budget request of the Green Mountain Care Board. We need to achieve a positive operating margin uh, in FY20. We need to build cash reserves for needed capital investments and for risk mitigation, particularly including our future participation in one care. We have, we have submitted our application effective July 31st to participate in one care Medicaid program effective uh, uh, January 1. But that, as you all recognize, uh, implies certain financial risk, particularly at the hospital side. So we will try to answer your questions. We'll talk more about these in the slides ahead. So I'm going to pass the microphone to Deb Durain to talk to you about the, the budget. Good morning. Good morning. Bear with me while I kind of juggle. I need a third hand here. Um, so our proposed net patient revenue for Copley um, includes a 3.5% increase budget to budget. That increase was deemed necessary after taking into consideration some what we consider to be significant cost savings for an organization of our size, uh, about 1.2 million in FY20, um, and incorporating trends that we were seeing in um, an unfavorable payer mix and an increase in bad debt and charity. Um, the 3.5% increase is, is necessary in order for us to achieve a positive operating margin for the first time in four years. We do recognize that uh, this request is technically an exception request in that our FY19 projections are um, currently forecasted to come in below our budget um, and that we would hit the, the cap of the 5% growth limit. Um, and so we are requesting an exception to that in this, in this budget filing. Looking back over the last five years, we think our proposed net revenue um, is, is reasonable. If you, if you take a look at this five-year trend, boils down to a five-year average annual increase of 2.8%, which is below the state average and, and lower than the willing to develop pair model goal limit growth to 3.5% a year. Our 
proposed change in average gross charges in this budget is a 9.8% increase in charges, and it's the equivalent of an 8.5% increase in the commercial rate, in that we're not expecting any additional reimbursement on um, professional fee schedules. That's why the, that's the, makes up the difference between the 9.8 and the 8.5. Over the last five years, our average annual, or not, not, not average annual, our cumulative rate increase is, is only 3.2%. So while 9.8% is quite a bit higher than what we've requested in an individual year over the last five years, actually for quite a while, we do think it's, it's, it's reasonable and necessary when you look at it in a five-year trend. Out of our total $72.7 million worth of, of net revenue that we're proposing, only 1.2 million of that is actually funded through rate changes from the last five years. So we don't believe that it's a significant burden on the rate payers over the five year trend. And with the benefit of hindsight, if you look at the graph on the, that, that we've provided in our five year history, um, we've been um, reducing rates regularly 4% in six, FY16, 3.7% in FY17, 3.4% in FY18. I think with the benefit of hindsight, looking at our NPR trends now, hindsight is 2020, uh, we believe we've been overcorrected in our rates. Um, and that this proposal is, is trying to get Copley um, back up closer to its peers um, and recoup some of that, that rate adjustment in order to help us achieve a positive operating margin. Um, we think later in this presentation we'll demonstrate that we've really done our, our best in terms of cost containment and put a lot on the table um, and just haven't, haven't quite been able to get all the way to our goal and are, are asking for your, for your help in getting us there to, to secure and sustain our financial future. Jeff? So uh, this slide, both uh, Dr. Dupuy and I are going to chat about, but the, the point we're going to make in the next few slides as we talk about issues and challenges, opportunities and risk. I suspect that by the end of next week, you're going to hear similar themes from each of the 14 Vermont hospitals uh, on the areas that are challenging us in our local communities and, and statewide. So uh, I, I have a hunch that, uh, that these are all themes that will be Remedial to you. Uh, in terms of our people, uh, recruitment and retention uh, is an enormous challenge, both in, in terms of skilled professionals, but in every in every position in the hospital, whether it be a laundry worker or a, or a clerk at, at our front desk, there are very low unemployment. There are lots of opportunities, so we are continuing to be challenged, as our peers are, in, in recruiting and, re and retaining people. And we have, Vermont has an aging population. Copley and others have an aging workforce. Uh, we'll talk more about this in a later slide, uh, particularly about our uh, primary care positions in our community. But these themes you will hear from, from Dr. Dupuy and I, uh, I suspect will, will ring true for you. Go on. Sure, like the rest of the uh, state and perhaps the country, uh, the nursing shortage can certainly affects us. Uh, we deal with that by being a clinical training center for both VTC and Norwich. And I think that has something to do with us doing reasonably well with young new nurses. However, it's certainly a significant challenge to find mid-career nurses that have an abundance of skills and experience. Uh, likewise, surgical techs are a specific problem for us. Uh, we deal with that by putting them through uh, school over in Concord, New Hampshire. We are currently have our second person going through that program. The, uh, the trade-off is a period of committed employment, probably. So for our community, Vermont's an aging state, and our local service area is certainly uh, no different. Uh, an aging population, uh, 
has uh, special requirements. As people age, uh, their joints give out, making uh, joint replacement in orthopedics uh, differentially more important. And likewise, you know, basically all new cancer I can think of, age is a significant risk factor for it, and oncology needs with an older population are more important too. We partner with CBH to provide uh, every other week uh, oncology uh, at Copley, and we have a busy infusion center for that. The other community need that uh, we feel as though is very important is our birth and center, women's, uh, women's health center. I certainly think if you ask anyone uh, in Lamoille uh, what the community hospital, what Copley should be doing, you're gonna get the answer birthing babies pretty high on their list. So the opioid crisis has certainly hit us as, as it's hit everyone else in the state. Um, our response to that has been uh, many uh, different strategies. Our practitioners, like everyone else in Vermont, have done a serious rethink about the place of uh, opioids in treating pain. And I think as a group, we've done a good job uh, decreasing the amount of uh, prescribed opioids. Is it working yet? Is it working yet? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. So it, additionally, we, we partnered with the North Central Vermont uh, Recovery Center to do both uh, yeah, inpatient and real-time uh, referrals in our ED and in our nursing forms. We also are working with them with a program to actually dispense Narcan directly to uh, at-risk people. Studies have shown that uh, the more Narcan you have in the community, the more lives you save. That's an important risk reduction uh, effort. And we are in the early phases uh, working with several community uh, members on tooling up for a rapid access to MAT, which is the uh, medical aided treatment, uh, which is uh, what CVH and uh, UVM have piloted, and uh, we hope soon to be joining them uh, in that. Certainly, dealing with uh, mental health challenges in our hospital are difficult. The regulatory and funding changes for the role of uh, law enforcement to assist in uh, behavioral challenges with mental health issues. Uh, it's certainly been difficult for us as it places a larger requirement on our resources to effectively deal with. We recently retooled one of our rooms in the ED to allow uh, safe and appropriate care of uh, mental health people. A significant problem uh, happens after the hospital is taking care of the acute needs of our patients, uh, particularly with mental health, drug treatment, and skilled nursing or rehab uh, needs. The ability to get them to the new facility in a timely fashion has certainly gotten more difficult uh, over time, leading us to uh, care for people that uh, really would be better cared at another facility. Physical and digital space. We have at our hospital space challenges. We have some absolutely recently renovated, modernized, terrific spaces. But we, we are uh, at a max. We are maxed out in, in many areas of, of our hospital delivery system. And, and that will need to be addressed in the future. Uh, additionally, if, if you walk in Copley, you will come away with two impressions uh, when you walk in the front door. It is immaculately clean, but many parts of the hospital are tired. The, the, the flooring, the paint, the ceilings, uh, and, and that, ha that is all part of deferred maintenance that will need to be addressed in the future. And, and we have a number of inefficient layouts that should not be as surprising because 
in the in the emergency rooms when I was here in 06 and 07, the the mental health crisis, the opioid crisis, uh, those problems were not emergent, but today they're they're relevant in every hospital. So we need we need to modernize, enhance, and expand certain spaces. Uh, digital space, uh, this is a first for me, and that Copley has currently four components of its electronic medical record system. One for the hospital, one for the rehab service, one for the emergency department, and one for Mansfield Clinic and the, and the uh, multi-specialty practices. So if those of you who are familiar with electronic health records, moving from one system to a new system is always a challenge. Assessing how to interface and connect uh, four different systems is more than a challenge. I would characterize it as a bit of a nightmare and a major need for us capitalized going forward. Uh, our current uh, hardware is at capacity and maxed out. We have, some, we have some software systems in accounting and pharmacy and in other critical areas. Uh, we have 187 uh, personal computers that need to move from Windows 7 to Windows 10 by the end of the year. So we have many challenges in our digital space. At the same time, as, as I've alluded to, because of our operating losses over the past four years, necessitated uh, investing in, in infrastructure and necessary investments to make sure we have enough cash on hand to keep the lights on and serve our patients. In terms of opportunities and risks, I'm going to turn this over back to Dr. Dupuy, who has uh, provided some excellent information. So we recently joined the New England Alliance uh, for Health NIA, which is a Dartmouth-run uh, by our group. And we're certainly looking forward to achieving uh, cost savings through uh, economies of scale through that. But beyond that, it also serves as a forum uh, to share knowledge and experience uh, between uh, varied hospitals. Second thing we're doing is expansion of community uh, services, uh, serving our community, as well as we can it is completely important to us. Uh, in telemedicine, we've partnered with Dartmouth to provide rheumatologic, pulmonary, and nephrology services to our local community. Uh, without uh, the commute of the patients uh, to Dartmouth, instead the electrons do most of the work. Sleep medicine um, is a difficult uh, area uh, statewide. The need for sleep medicine uh, badly outstrips uh, the capacity for all the hospitals in the state to provide it. Uh, we used to have an active sleep medicine program. We lost our managing physician. Uh, and so that's been mothballed until recently when we believe we have found a new managing physician and we're currently getting ready to restart the program. Looking forward to that. We recently uh, hired a new uh, young general surgeon at, at Copley who has brought surgical breast care back to the community, which has been very well received. <coughs> Physician engagement at Copley as the CMO is obviously something that uh, is important to me. Uh, and I'm always struck by the commitment of my fellow uh, practitioners uh, in their commitment primarily to quality, but also into the efficient uh, running of the hospital. Surgeons are particularly expensive uh, doctors in the hospital, uh, but we can, in fact, uh, contribute to cost containment in several ways, uh, largely through uh, consolidating uh, and making uh, our equipment and uh, implant needs uh, consistent between surgeon to surgeon, allowing us to uh, bargain more effectively and stock more efficiently. Because Copley is a small community hospital, strong community partnerships, of course, uh, vital for success if we're going to serve the needs of our community. 
or an active member in the UCC, the United Community Collaborative. And one of the ways that uh, that's manifested itself is joining with uh, Cheslow of our local FQHC uh, in placing a social worker in our emergency room. And uh, this has really been a tremendous success in two ways. First, um, it allows the loop to be closed for people who come to the emergency room but don't have a primary care positioner to follow up with. The referral specialists make sure that uh, the loop gets closed on that. And um, there was a program recently uh, that dealt with super users in the ED. It turns out that there is a small select group of patients who keep coming back to the emergency room day after day, week after week. Their needs are usually very complex, both medically and socially, and they require uh, a, a great deal of focused care to corral all the different and disparate uh, organizations uh, to really uh, meet their needs. It, it could be something just as simple as getting an air conditioner fixed and someone has COPD, and every time their air conditioner breaks, their COPD exacerbates, and they're back in the emergency room. So you can keep the air conditioning use uh, running, uh, they're going to be able to stay out of the hospital, which is good for them, and it's, of course, good for the healthcare system uh, as a whole. Uh, we studied um, that program for three months, and we found out that uh, if you paid enough attention, you could actually save almost a quarter million dollars in three months just on decreased AED visits and hospitalizations. So clearly, uh, that model of care, which I think is uh, basically in line with the principle of one care, uh, actually can work. Uh, another partnership uh, is with our local uh, skilled nursing facility, Morrisville uh, Manor. We regularly meet with them to review all our readmissions uh, so we can uh, in improve our communications and optimize uh, both of our practices to better serve the patients uh, to make sure that uh, you know, we're readmitting the people who really need to be readmitted and catching the things that might become a readmission uh, early, which is certainly, again, better for them and better for the healthcare system uh, as a whole. Uh, I think I've spoken about uh, our partnerships with, uh, with opioids. With the zero uh, suicide uh, endeavor, all of our patients that present, that are not, they're not small children, that present to the ED are screened uh, for suicide risks in the appropriate <coughs> referrals are, are then made. Let me pick it up here regarding uh, the category of risk. The one care uh, participation for the Medicaid population as of January 20th is, is both a risk and an opportunity. And we, we are hoping that we will have the financial resources available to move forward with this. The dues for us will be $195,000 a year. The potential downside risk is another approximately $200,000. Uh, on, the, on the plus side of this, by our participating with, with uh, one here, then Cheslev, our federally qualified health center, and the primary care physicians will have an opportunity for enhanced reimbursement. We recognize that having a robust an active primary care base is, is, is vital, but it, it brings some financial risk. Um, the Lamoille County's primary care landscape uh, is, is changing. Uh, I arrived, uh, I, I think I said it earlier, my first day at Copley was January 3rd, however, excuse me, June 3rd. However, I was able to come up for a day in April and a couple of days in May to get some orientation and meet with key players to, to facilitate my joining the hospital. Um, between my visit on April, uh, in April and my visit in May, we learned that three uh, active physicians at, at Cheslev, the community health center, uh, had uh, offered their resignations and were intending to, to enter private practice. The good news for our community is that they are opening a private practice in Morrisville. 
So Tamarack Family Medicine, three family physicians, three of the most full-time productive physicians will be opening their new office in October 1 in downtown, in downtown Morrisville. Uh, so, so that, if they had decided to leave and go outside the community, um, it would have been earth shattering because we've had continued loss of primary care practices in our service area. Uh, one of our nearby towns, Johnson, which is the home of uh, Northern Vermont University and a vibrant small town, uh, this past year lost its uh, community uh, provider. Uh, Hardwick Health Center uh, in, in the town of Hardwick within the past year has had two of its long-time family physicians retire. So, we, and, and we, have, we anticipate that there will be other primary care physicians retiring in the not too distant future. Uh, last night at Copley, we had a special board meeting. Uh, when, when Kevin Mullen and Robin Lunge were with us, and we heard about the, what's happening in Vermont, and in fact the nation, in terms of the supply of primary care physicians and advanced practice providers. So all of us are facing uh, enormous challenges. Everybody is recruiting for primary care either to add or to replace, and, and we're no different. So, and finally, a risk we have is funding vital community services. Can Copley continue to provide the services the community needs without a positive operating margin? And do we remove service lines to maintain a positive operating margin while meeting our cap? I mean, that's a question that, that at least three other critical access hospitals in Vermont have faced, uh, resulting in the, in the closure of their birthing center. On, on my second day at Copley on June 4th, during our finance committee meeting, uh, Dr. John Macy, who's a member of the finance committee, shared with us a wonderful article that I will make copies of for the board, published in April 19 by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, that talked to northern New England, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, in the, the effect of primary care physicians leaving communities, hospitals uh, leaving or, or not any longer providing a birthing service, and what that, what that provides as a barrier for, for access. So this is a, a wonderful study reiterating many of the things that we're talking about, others will talk about. So there are our, in sort of narrative term, we've laid out our opportunities, challenges, risks, Deb will talk with you here about our financial health indicators and, and what we need to move forward. So at Copley, we monitor a, a plethora of key financial indicators. I've only displayed a few on, on this chart just to, to kind of keep the conversation simple. Um, I've characterized them in three categories uh, to talk about our, our trends and profitability, our leverage position, and, and also liquidity. Can you hear me? Um, looking at the operating margin, we've already discussed that, that trend. Um, four years of operating losses in a row, our, our budget is looking to, to try to turn that back around. Um, total margin also trending unfavorably. The, the one solid year in FY17 with a 3.9% total margin was, was really due to tremendous philanthropic support from our community for our OR project, without which we would have had a loss that year as well, um, with a possible break even. Generally, at Cobbly, we'd like to target a 3% operating margin. We feel that that would be reasonable and enough to allow us to to make certain prudent investments in our infrastructure and, and, and other capital needs. In FY20, this budget proposes a 1.4% operating margin, getting us halfway there, essentially. 
we still have more uh, work to do. Um, in terms of our leverage, I've presented uh, long-term debt to capitalization and debt service coverage ratio, um, which I think uh, displays a, a satisfactory level of debt. I don't think we're too highly leveraged. Um, our debt service coverage is trending unfavorably, but that's more a result of our uh, unfavorable profitability trends. We get that back in line, and I think our, our leverage in terms of liquidity, days cash on hand is something I, I monitor quite quite regularly. Um, it remains an unfavorable trend. We've been you know, continuing to pay our, our bills very timely. I didn't show the, the AP days ratio on here, but you guys have that at your disposal. You can see that we're going to pay quicker than our peer group. Um, but in order to keep that days cash on hand um, something more tolerable, had to defer capital investments, which we'll be talking about in our capital slot later in the presentation. Our proposed financials include, as we said earlier, a 3.5% increase in, in net revenue. Um, just to touch on a few other key elements, um, provide a little additional explanation. Our other operating revenue is proposed to decline nearly $400,000. A big chunk of that is uh, the termination of our support service agreement with the Vermont State Psychiatric Hospital. Um, that was contributing to about uh, $590,000 reduction in our other operating revenue. Um, and, and operating expenses have declined in um, coordination with that amount as well. So it's not a significant hit to our bottom line, simply off, the top, off of our revenue and off of our expenses. Vermont Psychiatric Hospital actually hired our pharmacy staff and um, no longer really needed to outsource that support. Um, offsetting some of that $500,000 decline are some other revenue opportunities that, that we've, we've seen some, some gain in partic of particular uh, interest to you might be our industrial rehab program where uh, folks from our rehab department are out in our community providing support to various uh, corporations within our community to help them keep their employees healthy um, and evaluate their, their job readiness. Also, we do um, receive grant revenue, um, research revenue for some orthopedic research programs that are, that are underway that are kind of exciting. Total, total operating expenses in our budget are proposed to increase only 1.8%, and that's the lowest that Copley has, has put forward for a proposed um, one-year increase in, in operating expenses. I'm very proud of that, actually. It took a lot of great work to keep that contained, um, which we're going to talk about shortly. Uh, bringing us to uh, operating margin, or an operating surplus of a million dollars, and a total um, excess of revenue over expenses of $1.3 million in our proposed budget. Again, not, not quite the goal. We, we hope to accomplish, like I said, a 3% operating margin. We're about halfway there. Um, presented the balance sheets. Just want to highlight a couple of little, little um, items of note in here. Uh, board designated assets of 4.7 million. That represents our funded depreciation account. Uh, we do continue to fund depreciation. However, we've been significantly underspending our capital budget to preserve our cash position in case we need it. So you'll see the decline in our property and equipment and an increase in those four digit data funds. Um, they are available to spend at our discretion, or the board's discretion, we should, we should we need them. Those are things I wanted to highlight on the balance sheet. So I want to focus the majority of my conversation, I suppose, on um, expense drivers and cost containment. Because I think Perhaps in the past we have maybe not spent enough attention on this on this subject with Copley. Um, expense drivers, I think you're going to hear a lot of the similar similar stories um, for many of the hospitals. We we certainly struggle with the inflationary pressure on wages um, and benefits, um, not just related to um, the individual wage that folks are requesting and, and trying to keep up with the cost of living in the state of Vermont, but also the cost of turnover, um, the cost of recruitment and retention, uh, 
to keep people with high high skills in our organization. Also, significant inflationary pressure on drugs, double-digit increases at times. For Copley in particular, oncology drugs make up actually more than half of our pharmaceutical spend. Those that inflationary pressure in that bucket is quite significant. We'll talk about that a little more later. And also inflationary pressure on supplies and plants in particular. Those are things that we've been contending with over several years. You've heard that from us every year. Um, <coughs> another, another element to add is that, that maybe we haven't talked about enough in the past is our service mix and the complexity of the care that we provide at Copley. Um, and you have heard we have a renowned uh, orthopedic program. We, we certainly provide more orthopedic care than uh, our critical access peers do in the state. And that does have an impact on our cost structure. I've presented a chart here, I'm trying to walk you through it, um, showing our cost per adjusted admission. has been um, one of the ratios that, that we follow that Copley has not trended favorably in over the last several years, uh, in particular compared to our critical access peer group. Um, I'm going to try to explain why. Um, I've also, so the cost per adjusted admission is the blue line. On the red line is our case mix index. That's a, a measure of the complexity of the care that we're providing in an inpatient setting. Um, and as you can see, that has grown tremendously over the last five years. You know, 1.15 in, in FY15 and up to 1.37 currently in, um, in FY19. When you case mix adjust our cost per adjusted admission and factor in the complexity of the care that we're providing, um, that's the purple one at the bottom. It's really a, a reasonable trend in cost compared to the intensity of the services that we're providing. Um, it's a, an average annual increase over that five year period of only 1.6%. Cost containment efforts at Copley, um, certainly to me in the day to day life have felt um, significant, but we've done it in a more uh, thoughtful, maybe slower, strategic approach. Um, we really want to um, have it be a part of the culture at Copley and, and not an event where we're, um, forgive the expression, but cutting off our nose to spite our face. <laughs> um, we've really been very thoughtful and strategic about it over the last several years. Um, displaying this chart is the trend each year since FY17 of the cost savings initiatives that we've targeted and built into each budget of those years, um, broken down by categories, labor, supply chain, and other costs in the three buckets. Um, labor costs and supply chain being the two areas that, that we've really struggled with, um, and I'll go into a little more about cost drivers in those areas. Um, but over the, the, these four years, Copley's committed to nearly five million in cost savings, which I think is significant organization our size um, has been a great endeavor a lot of hard hard work and teamwork in our organization uh, to do this in a way that, that we feel is attainable and thoughtful and, and, and not to cause a significant morale problem when you come back and um, really put your organization at jeopardy and um, be able to continue to provide the high quality excellent care that we do provide to date, we have achieved 3.5 million of that, nearly 5 million in savings. As I said before, we still have we still have more work, more work to do. Um, some of the, um, if you want to know more details about some of the examples of, of these cost savings, you know, just please ask and you can go into that during the question and answer section in the interest of time. So we can get through the slide. In FY20, our proposed operating expenses, if you look back over the uh, uh, three-year period, reflects an average annual growth of only 2.8%. I'm super proud of that. I think that, I mean, that's, that's it's, it's sort of like finally, you know, the efforts that we're putting forward, we're starting to see come to fruition. And I know that we have, for the last several years, asked for your patients, and I think it's, it's paying off, so thank you. Um, though I think our cost the efforts have been significant. We still weren't quite able to achieve that, that desired 3% operating margin all in one year. So again, we're asking whether you're not going to help in terms of sort of 
writing our rates to help us get a little closer to that. Um, and we'll continue our work in future years to get to that 3% operating margin. So highlighting some of the cost drivers related to labor and, and related costs, I think, I think these are not going to be surprising to you at all. We've heard this from us year after year. Uh, we continue to have, you know, over the last several years, continue to have a need for travelers. We will always have a need for travelers. Um, we are, um, I'm going to skip around the slide a little bit, but we are actively collaborating um, with academic institutions and um, making investments in growing our workforce from within in order to help address some of those um, cost pressures related to the, the need for travelers, but it will never be eliminated. In our FY20 budget and in our FY19 actual experience, we are we are seeing a reduction in travelers, and so that has been some cost savings that we've been able to, to put forward into our budget. Um, market adjustments when we have turnover or in order to retain skilled folks um, definitely apply apply pressure to our wage. Um, and also again, service mix. You know, the, the mix of services that we provide and the growing complexity of the, the patients that we care for or not. Not just with orthopedics, but also with, with um, mental health and, and substance use um, disorder patients who, who need extra one on one care um, have been areas of cost pressure for coupling. If you look to the chart on the right hand side, I probably should have put a percentage in there. Um, the historical actual growth is sort of represented in that dotted trend line. Uh, has been about a 4.7 percent annual increase. If you kind of take a look at FY19 and FY20, the blue bar there being our, our projections and proposed budget, we're sort of bending that curve. We're coming in under that historical trend uh, from, the, from the work that we've been doing. Um, in addition to trying to grow our workforce from within and, and address our, our challenges with travelers and retention, we've also, over the course of these several years, been able to identify workforce efficiencies and reduce FTEs largely through attrition. Um, we have a hiring action committee whenever a position becomes vacant where the leader of that department has to provide support for why they continue to meet that role and, and are always looking at a vacancy as an, an opportunity to create some efficiency that they have to justify um, replacement of that FTE. I think that um, activity has, has served us well over the last year or two. Uh, in addition to uh, the workforce um, efficiencies that are built into our cost savings, um, NIA will also provide us some savings on the, on the benefit management side, um, as well as, I put a list on the slide, as well as in clinical education. So we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to the relationship and the, the the other things you're going to gain from that affiliation that are not cost savings, but will add value to our organization and the care that we provide in our community. Taking a look at the chart on the bottom right related to productivity, I, in keeping with our case mix adjustment conversation, trying to reflect and, and demonstrate our FTE structure compared to the complexity of the services that we provide. We um, have shown FTEs per 100 adjusted emissions, which historically not a favorable trend on the surface um, when you look at Copley. However, when you case mix adjust it, we're actually trending favorably. We're kind of flat and down a little. Um, I see this as you know, a positive sign of the work that we're doing. Related to the supply chain, um, this is also a significant um, area of cost for Copley, especially given our um, concentration of orthopedic care. And our concentration in, in oncology services. Both, both of those service lines come with, with high cost of, of drugs um, and implants, um, but are, are necessary to serve our community and the community, our surrounding communities. Related to drugs, we've seen a history of double digit inflationary increases and have been challenged, like everyone else, um, to contend with drug shortages that require you to find an alternative drug that often is not cheaper and, um, and to incur additional costs and, and spend resources within your organization to, to mix and make the drugs that you need. Um, if you 
you look at the drug cost trend chart off on the right hand side, uh, FY15 to FY18, that dotted trend line um, represents a 12.8% average annual increase. And that's very difficult to contend with for the 3.5% cap that we're trying to manage to. Um, part of that has been inflationary pressure, but another piece of it has been the growth of our oncology and medical infusion care program that we uh, run in conjunction with Central Vermont Medical Center. Um, we have definitely seen grow, grow over the years and, and actually represents about half of that drug spend. If you look at FY19, largely due to our um, purchasing power that we're going to gain as a part of our affiliation, uh, we're, gonna, we're seeing you know, the, the bending of that cost for um, the drug costs as well. Um, related to supplies, um, similar, similar charts, that trend line um, shows a 7.6% average annual increase from FY15 to FY18, and FY19 and 20 are showing us coming in under that. Um, that historical growth trend has been not just due to um, inflationary pressure, but also the increased demand for orthopedic care. Um, as we see our, our population aging, I, I have every reason to believe that the demand for that service is going to continue to grow and that, that company needs to be, be ready to meet that demand. Um, also, we do have patients who come um, from all over, outside of our service area, outside of the country, attracted to the, the excellent program that we have. It's a, a fantastic reputation. Um, and uh, some of those folks are, you know, have heard about custom-made implants like the conformist knee um, and are interested in uh, pursuing that type of an implant. Um, that's also something that's applied pressure to our um, implant costs over the years. And we make some changes in that coming in the future. Related to cost savings efforts um, in the supply chain, Mia, we've already talked about, um, that'll be about a, a $200,000 savings in, in our supply chain area. Um, also, we do continue to participate in 340B. Um, we expanded that participation, I believe, last year, when the year before, um, into our um, infusion center and expanded that in, in outpatient settings. That, that's accountable to $170,000 worth of cost savings for Copley. Um, and, and since I know the question may come up um, for a point of clarity, Copley currently only participates in the, the cost savings side of the 340B program. We do not have a retail pharmacy 340B program, so there is no other operating revenue associated with that in, in, in this budget. In the past, we've explored the opportunity to pursue that from several years ago. We've actually explored it two, maybe three times. Um, and Copley simply does not attribute enough uh, prescriptions for us to be able to effectively run and, and, and gain a benefit from having the retail side of that, of that program. So in lieu of Copley Hospital having the program, Chesla Heart QHC in the community has the benefit of that program. And um, therefore, our community is benefiting from it and from the, the cheaper prescriptions, prescription costs that comes with it. We just don't get the revenue. Um, another area where um, we're anticipating cost savings has to do with um, inventory management improvements and um, physician engagement in that process. We have a um, very caring, um, very engaged group of surgeons who um, I'm impressed by day after day in their commitment to this hospital. I know that they're helpful be able to then that cost can on our supply chain side as well. So hopefully more positive news on those subjects to come in our in future budget presentation. An update on our FY19 <coughs> performance. So in the slide deck I have um, given you June actuals because it was due before July was But as of June, our net revenue was down 2.8%. Um, we are submitted a projected budget of 
projections for FY19 indicating that we expected maybe 2.6 percent decline in our net patient revenue. That's largely due to unfavorable pyramid shift that we're seeing in FY19 um, from less commercial payers to more Medicare um, beneficiaries. So Medicare in um, the previous year was 36 percent of our business and it's now 40 percent of our business. That's a sound small, but it's actually a very significant shift. Really has reduced our net revenue by over a million dollars. Um, we've also had a uh, challenging experience at the beginning of the, the fiscal year that I know that you heard about during our enforcement hearing um, related to the medical leave of, of Dr. Huber um, that Jeff referred to earlier. Um, that has has been an impact. Um, however, we're seeing you know the rest of the, the orthopedic team really pulling together and, and kind of making up a, a significant majority of surgeon's workload, not 100% of it, but um, a significant portion. In addition to his medical leave, I can put this on the slide here, sorry, um, we had um, retirement of a dental surgeon um, that has had an impact with our, the only pediatric dental surgeon in our um, state, I believe, and also slower than expected ramp, ramp up of some other new surgeons. But the most significant impact really being that pyramid shift. And we've also seen an increase in bad debt and charity care that's higher than budgeted. Those trends have, have both been incorporated into our FY19 proposed budget. On the expense side, um, as of the end of June, we were uh, below budget by nearly a percent. Um, we projected to maintain that um, essentially through cost control measures that we've put in place. We heard about that uh, not only in our enforcement hearing, but just, just recently our, our cost reduction discussion that we have on Iron Hiring Action Committee, and we've also um, incorporated extra purchasing approvals and sort of made the purchasing process a, a little more challenging to um, and have a little more input and feedback into how we're spending our money. Um, but counterbalancing that, you know, has been the continual wage pressure that we experience and inflation on our, our drugs and implants. New this year because we've actually had um, favorable health insurance claim experience in the past. This, this FY19 marks a significantly unfavorable year in this area. Um, not just regular claims experience, but also we've had a couple of, of significant um, catastrophic events um, for some of our, a couple of our employees in particular, um, causing our stop loss insurance to, to raise its limits, um, essentially adding $500,000 worth of benefit cost to copy that we, we didn't build into the budget. So it brings us down to an operating loss of nearly a million, 1.8% operating loss margin um, for FY19. That's the, again, fourth year in a row of not generating a positive operating margin, which has deteriorated our cash um, to 67.6 days as of the end of June. So as of the end of July, um, our net revenue slipped a little more. It is now 3% below um, the low budget. Um, and we're not anticipating any significant gains or improvement in that between now and the end of the year. Um, summer months tend to be vacation times. I, I don't anticipate any um, boom in utilization. In fact, uh, August will probably be another challenge. We have a, a number of slides to, to review with you, but let us move quickly through these uh, so that this is sort of a summation, so you'll have ample time for questions and clarifications. So, <laughs> so you know, I, I, these points are, uh, Vermont's eight critical access hospitals are all unique serving your respected communities. You understand that, we understand that. Copley is not the typical critical access hospital. We have a center of excellence in orthopedic care. Uh, we have five now full-time, uh, well, Brian is on medical leave, full-time 
fellowship trained orthopedic surgeons. We're drawing patients from all over the state and region. Uh, Copley is, is a engaged community partner. We are the uh, largest full-time employer in the community. We're active in virtually every facet of the, of the wellness initiatives, health initiatives. We work with our academic programs and we intend to be engaged in collaborative partner. Thanks, Lauren. Dawn. <coughs> so this is the exceptional care of quality, fo uh, community focused slide. Uh, the top bit is just to remind me that we're very at all our commitment to uh, having a birthing center and a women's center, both uh, in service uh, to the community's needs. Measuring quality in healthcare is an extremely difficult thing to do, uh, as you know. Um, almost certainly, uh, the best way to do it is through, at least for surgical care, through the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program run by the American uh, College of Surgeons. Uh, under the rubric of uh, quality, access, and, and affordability as desirable healthcare goals, uh, one often hears that there's an implicit trade-off between access and, and quality. And uh, this data, which is our Nesquip data from Calvinder 18, is basically presented as an emphatic, like that's not just not so at all. Uh, if, if you're interested, I'll be happy to explain the whole thing in excruciating detail, but in the interest of time, uh, we'll just move uh, right to the chase. Um, uh, Nesquip requires a little bit of money, but quite a bit of effort for a hospital. So really only hospitals that have an above average commitment uh, to tracking and improving their quality participate in Nesquip uh, at all. So even if you're an average Nesquip hospital, you're, you're doing pretty, pretty well. Um, in this slide, average, if you move to the odds ratio column, uh, average is one. If you're below average, you're, you're up. if you're below one, you're above average. If you're above one, uh, you're below average. This particular data is, uh, is presented yearly by NISQIP, and it takes into account the differences in patient risk factors before surgery. It takes into account the relatively small sample size. We only enter 1,300 cases. Uh, as opposed to about a million cases overall for Nesquip. And all, all of these things have statistical consequences and Nesquip has worked this all out. So what you're getting here is really an apple to apple uh, comparison between the work that Copley does in providing outcomes to patients from our surgical care versus the rest of the, the Nesquip world. And uh, as you can see, if you go down the odds ratio column, uh, we're below one in pretty much everything. Uh, we're dramatically below one. In fact, we're in the, in the first uh, quartile uh, in morbidity. And morbidity is basically a synonym for complications uh, here uh, for UTIs associated with our surgical care and uh, for readmissions. In fact, not only um, are we an exemplar, which is this book's name for being in the first quartile, uh, our confidence limits, our 95% confidence limits on the odds ratio, it's actually below one, which actually makes us uh, an, an outlier, which is really, I guess maybe you could put two stars there the next time. Um, so um, when, when, we, when we tell people that, that we're not your average uh, little hospital, um, it's, it's not just our boast. Uh, Nesquip thinks so too. Our capital budget plan um, in FY19, uh, as I alluded to earlier, we've significantly underspent our capital budget in the interest of preserving our limited cash reserves. We've underspent it by two million, deferring some some needed investments. In FY20, uh, we have proposed a capital budget that limits uh, our spending to the amount of our depreciation. Uh, none of those items are over 500000 and um, I just you know, need, to, need to say, and, and, and hopefully you hear it, we cannot continue to um, 
defer our capital investments, we are going to need to be able to fund these investments for, for the future. Uh, there are a couple of major capital investments that we see in the next couple of years as being uh, important. Uh, a fully functioning and integrated health information system, since we do have four and we're relying on interfaces and a lot of manual interventions um, in working with these four products that, that add risk to Copley and also challenge the continuity of patient care. It's, it's not ideal for the patient experience. It's not ideal for our staff as well and their productivity. Uh, we're also looking at um, opportunities to replace our MRI. We currently use a 20-year-old mobile unit that only has refurbished parts available. Um, we're evaluating our options of a fixed site versus mobile site uh, mobile MRI um, and are really looking to the need to improve the quality of the images that the MRI can provide and to provide a better patient experience. It's not really a great experience in the mobile MRI that we have currently. Um, long range financial plans. Ultimate goal is to strengthen Copley's financial position and our flexibility. We, we, it's imperative that we achieve a 3% operating margin in 21 and beyond. <coughs> We intend to continue to prudently and strategically manage our costs. I think that we've demonstrated today that, that we're capable of doing that and intend to continue that work. Um, however, it will be unrealistic to expect that we're gonna be able to have a million and a half every year of cost savings at some point. Uh, that rate of cost savings opportunity is gonna decline. Um, we continue to focus on operational efficiencies at Copley. That's a hot topic since we're largely surgical. We think optimizing the utilization of that fixed capacity um, and an appropriate utilization is, is what will help keep costs down in our organization. We do anticipate seeing a growing need for services due to the aging of our population, but also with Loyal County has seen a population growth. Um, with an operating margin, we intend to renew efforts to, to prudently fund and capital investments. We also will be working hard to improve integration of services with primary care, um, other hospitals, and uh, the community at large. We um, and would like to participate in the One Care Medicare program, Medicaid program, forgive me. Um, however, we're, we're discussing that with our board and looking at ways that we can fund those dues and manage that new financial risk on behalf of our primary care partners that we don't employ. Uh, we also certainly intend to continue efforts to improve care coordination. That's very important to um, caring for our, our population. We think all of these plans tie into the goals of the all payer model. I think it's, it's certainly uh, maybe an achievable goal statewide uh, to contain our growth to 3.5%, but I do feel that individual hospitals need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis because we are all unique. We all have different service mix. We have different utilization trends and demographics. Um, we all have different capital needs and overall uh, financial health position needs to be factored into um, NPR goals for each hospital. Historically, taking a look back at our NPR compliance, um, over the last three years, uh, we've implemented the 11% rate reduction, um, or reduction in gross average gross charges, as we call it now. Um, our actual Growth in NPR is only cumulatively 4.4%, which is a 1.5% average annually, um, certainly lower than 3.5% goal. And cumulatively, our budget is within compliance. Right. Taking a look at the overall total cost of care um, for patients in our community, I've highlighted the, the Morrisville service area. We have the, the lowest growth rate in the state at only 2.3%, likely due to the 11% rate reductions that we've implemented over the last several years. Um, this is probably the, the one of the largest contributors to this outcome, um, including other efforts, cost containment efforts at, at Copley and excellent coordination of care between our community partners. I think it's an, it's a, Awesome outcome, 2.3% growth. However, uh, if you look at the next chart, um, taking a look at where we land in 
comparison to the other hospitals within the state. We're way down there at the bottom um, with the, the lowest uh, annual expenditure per capita and also the lowest total resource use. So we are not overutilizing services and those services cost the least in the state. Um, I think that's wonderful news. However, given our financial condition, maybe we have been overcorrected and, and need to be bumped back up a little closer to some of the rest of the hospitals in the state in order to secure our financial stability. Finally, let me close. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, respectfully, and we understand the very um, challenging job you have. We ask the Remont Care here to approve our budget as requested with the ability to earn a modest 20 operating margin, pledge to control costs, promote quality, access, work with our partners, have a robust primary care contingent in our community, which is vitally important. And let me, let me bring a, a totally outside perspective. So uh, this slide, shows a very unique statue on the, in the slide. It's called the Forrest G. McGaw Prize. This prize sits in the lobby of Copley Hospital. And when I asked our department leaders the other day how many had noticed this or had seen this, uh, we got a lot of blank looks with the exception of two of our employees who've been there 30 years. The Forrest McGaw Prize is the highest award by the American Hospital Association. Uh, been made since 86. We were awarded the second prize together with uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut in 1987, recognizing distinguished services to improve the health and well-being of communities. And, and with your help, we will continue to, to fulfill this noble work. When I, when I went on the website to look up the prize, because I had seen it, I had noticed it, and decided I would share it with you. 2017, this uh, prize was awarded to Yale New Haven Hospital. 2015, it was awarded to Mass General Hospital. 2011, it was awarded to our colleague hospital in the state of Vermont, Mona Scottney Rehab Center and Hospital. 2004, it was awarded to the Henry Ford Hospital System. It's a prize that you apply for, a very rigorous panel, and we we will always be proud to be a recipient of the Forest Team of Law Prize, and we hope that we will continue to do this noble work. Thank you for your patience, your attention, and your consideration of our budget. And we would be happy to try to respond to your questions. Thank you, Jeff. And Jeff, never apologize to being for uh, <laughs> We'll help it sometimes. So we're going to start with Dr. Holmes. Thank you. Um, I agree. Very thorough. Very interesting. No one thought of us. Um, and I want to first say I really appreciate all of the cost savings. I mean, we've been talking about that for a few years, and I, it's very clear in the numbers that uh, we've done in a very intentional and thoughtful way, and it's really had a huge impact. And I'm glad to see you're in a purchasing group now, and we've talked about that over years. I'm glad to see that's happened. Um, also, just want to applaud the total cost of care for capital increase. And, Pressing the resources because I understand maybe there was some overcorrection in there, but still, we're in the quadrant. Still working low. Yeah, still working low. Yeah, yeah. Working low. yeah. 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 Well, I appreciate that. And the quality measures that you were able to show. Um, and I'll ask a couple questions about that in a second, but I would still say I'm, I, I worry about Hopper. Hopper is one of the hospitals that I worry about. Um, we've seen you know, over 100 hospitals closed since 2010, rural hospitals. And over my time at the board, hospitals that have turned themselves around and moved from red to black and been able to achieve greater financial sustainability than those hospitals that have either affiliated or have informal ties with other institutions, right, so that they can 
share services so that they can bring, you know, ask to specialty care into their, uh, into their region so that they can spread types of costs, you know, whether it's IP or other types of shared services. You know, Brattleboro Porter, those were a couple of examples that we heard about from Brattleboro yesterday, um, on Monday. And we heard a great presentation earlier this year from an outside expert that said really the path to sustainability of rural hospitals involves acquiring and having primary care in the hospital network and also affiliations, collaborations with other institutions to share services and to gain economies of scale. So I, you have some uh, affiliations or some agreements going on with CBMC on oncology. You have telemedicine happening with Dr. Hitchcock. Can you talk a little bit about what other initiatives you might engage in to try and enhance some of those opportunities? One and two, on the primary care front, you talked about the loss of primary care in your area, um, an expanded area. Are there any opportunities for potential recruitment within Copley Hospital of primary care to you know, supplant those actually been lost in the area? Two excellent questions, and thank you for your positive uh, notes. Uh, one would have to be living in a cave not to think about uh, affiliations. So uh, I, I've had the good fortune of being, this is my eighth interim CEO role. So it's, it's unusual to see a small critical access hospital remaining entirely independent. So I, I, in, in my earliest of days, I reached out to colleagues at Dartmouth, and I've had an opportunity to have some ex uh, discussions <coughs> with Dr. John Brunstad at University of Law Medical Center. Um, Dartmouth, frankly, had, at this point, has its plate full in terms of how it's looking to affiliate, particularly with hospitals outside of the state of New Hampshire. Dartmouth, for those who don't know, Dartmouth is attempting a major merger with uh, Granite One, which is the Catholic Medical Bank. So they're putting their full attention <coughs> now on that affiliation. However, they're reaching out with telemedicine, with visiting specialists, and we will always pursue them. At, at University of Vermont Medical Center, they, as, as you all know, have relationships with uh, Central Vermont Medical Center, with Porter, with a number of hospitals in Vermont, and, and the, the, the message I had to John Rumstead is, I am the interim guy here for three or four months. The door will always remain open for continued discussions, but one suggestion I offered to him um, is that one, one size does not necessarily fit all. So at this point, with University Law Medical Center, the relationships they have with the other hospitals is, is essentially an ownership position. And, and because of my, in 2002 and 2003, I was the interim CEO of the London Hospital, just south of Hanover, and we affiliated with Dartmouth in a brand new model that they created, which was a three-year management contract, where we were able to keep local community control of our core services, of our board, that we we uh, we employed our CEO jointly with Dartmouth. And that model was so successful that after three years, New London became a part of the Dartmouth system uh, willingly and successfully. So uh, I've asked uh, Dr. Brumstead if he would consider, if they would consider other models for affiliation other than their current model. And he indicated to me that he, and I don't speak for him, that he, he would talk about that with his leadership team, et cetera. So the other, you know, we have other independent hospitals to the north and east of us, uh, four hospitals, and, and it would, it's not, um, it would not be untoward that we could not find opportunities to join in combining services or sharing economies of scale with those other hospitals. So I, 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 as the interim, I can't speak for our board or our leadership, but my advice to our board and leadership is being fiercely independent 
as the ship is sinking is not a sound strategy. So, so that's, and I'd be glad to try to embellish that. In, in terms of, in terms of primary care, we became aware of uh, Dr. John Dunn, who's an independent physician in Jeffersonville, Cambridge, who's been in private practice now for a couple of years, and he is he is uh, having financial challenges. So we have referred him to Cheslev. We have uh, talked with, we suggested he talk with his colleagues at Tamarack Family Medicine that's about to open their new practice. We have said that we would, we would want to continue discussions with him about how we can maintain his primary practice in the Cambridge, Jeffersonville area, including the possibility of him relocating to Johnson, uh, which is a larger community, a more robust community. So we will, we will help Cheslev, we will help Tamarack, we will help our primary care physicians to the, the best of our ability. Thank you, I really appreciate the candid answer. Um, with respect to access, I appreciate also the access and quality, sometimes tensions, people argue that you know, it's hard to have access and have quality, particularly in small rural areas. Yes, you're giving the microphone to the right person, but I want to talk about your slides. Um, you know, there is, there is empirical evidence out there that the number of cases can be tied to quality outcomes. Your data suggests that you're doing an excellent job of making the quality on surgical outcomes. And so I wonder, uh, do you have minimum volume standards that help you choose the types of surgeries and procedures that allow you to have that quality standard? Uh, meet that quality standard? I guess the most direct answer to your question is, is, is no. Um, of course, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, it is true that in selected cases, uh, volume tracks quality. Interestingly enough, it's mostly based on the institution and not on the surgeon. So low volume surgeons in a high volume institution tend to do better than high volume surgeons in low volume institutions. So, so that is true. Um, however, none of the things that, that we do uh, are really you know, captured uh, in, that, in that model. We really don't do things uh, that have been shown to uh, have quality track uh, volume. So the, the cases that, that we concentrate on at, at Copley are things that, that we do fantastically well, and that even though our entire case volume, which is somewhere in the, in the uh, low 2000s is not very high, um, we actually do do quite a few of the things we do. And that's, I think, why we do those things so well. We don't, we're not trying to be all things to all people, uh, but the things that we, we do offer, which you know, should be 80 to 90% of uh, our community's health care, uh, are things we do not, not even just well, we do them extremely well. Hopefully that sort of answers it. Yeah, it does. It's a, you know, the birthing center, I recognize people <coughs> want a birthing center in their community. Right? I would want a birthing center near me. I'm yeah. watching a little child that wanted to go for 15, 20 minutes um, away to get to, to deliver that child. But I also worry about, uh, you know, hospitals that are delivering fewer than 200 babies a year. There's some evidence that there's some quality that can compromise in the sense of, uh, you know, the death of that post part of the So if there are things that, I, that, I, I, that I'm recognizing are trade-offs. So I, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. Yeah, um, so, uh, I mean, again, that's, you know, we, we see the same world uh, that you do. Most uh, of the risk uh, can be foreseen and, and dealt with uh, appropriately. Uh, so we, we definitely do have a birth and center, and we definitely want to continue it, and the people who live near us definitely want us to continue it. But we don't offer that service to, to everybody. We have fairly strict criteria for you know, low to average risk birthing at, at our facility. So you're, you're exactly right. There, there is a concern. We completely share your concern. And, uh, and we feel as though we act uh, appropriately to, to maintain the uh, appropriate uh, risk profile for our patients. And your quality metrics show that. So I appreciate that. Um, quick question about a little bit about the cost savings. And one of the things that struck me 
might be for you, Deb, but um, you put up a ch uh, chart on there on the FTE for adjusted admission. One of the, the statistics that stood out to me was your FTE for adjusted bed. So your FTE for adjusted bed is 11. The state average is 6. So I don't know how that tracks with the data that you had about FTE for adjusted admission and why there'd be such a difference, but that stood out to me as how is that staffing working that you're so above the average It may yet again be a factor of our service mix. You know, as a critical access hospital, we're limited to only 25 beds. Um, inpatient services really are not the significant driver of revenue at our hospital, where we do more outpatient care than we do inpatient care in our facility. And so that statistic may be just be challenged by that service mix. What would be your, so if you had your average daily census per staff bed, what would that be on average? Or in the minimum the max of that. Yeah, I think our average daily census is around 15. I think it's at 14 right now. Um, and, and that's how we staff. We staff to that uh, 15. Got it. Okay, so you're not staffing to 25, but having. No, 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 we don't staff to the beds. We, we staff to our average daily census and our, our expected demand for services. And, um, you know, they're adjusting that based on, you know, the surgical schedule. And you might be able to speak more to that than I can on the nursing side. I'm, I'm seeing, I see heads nodding. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's basic basically true. I mean, average is, of course, just average. It actually changes. If you're doing a significant surgical volume, uh, the actual census change, it can change quite a bit from day to day. It can be 10 and then 20. So it averages at 14. But the, the day to day variation and therefore the, the uh, staffing requirements change, change dramatically. And, uh, you know, we, we work hard at, at, at making that making that great. Yeah, I'm sure that's a challenge. I've heard from other hospitals that that is a challenge. Um, quick question about the investing in the sleep. Is that something that you guys have been talking about investing in the sleep? So one of the things when we hear about community needs is sleep, I was interested by your comment that uh, needs are far exceeding capacity. When I hear about from community needs, we hear about mental health, we hear about dental, we hear about substance misuse. I don't think until this presentation I've heard a lot of sleep center needs. So I'm just curious about that, right. your decision to reinvest in the sleep. Yeah, I don't, I don't think our community has you know, as an especially high volume. Nobody uh, sleeping uh, uh, and more yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but what actually what actually happens is that uh, the backlog for sleep studies in the state is is impressive. I mean, to the to the point where hospitals are just renting hotel rooms and, and equipping them uh, to do it. So that's that's really the problem. It, it's a, it's a generic problem. It's not it's it's not just to us. But you're feeling the need to some degree. Yeah, and, and, and well, yeah, we already, we have the facility because we, we used to have this service and uh, it was just a, it was just a staffing uh, problem at the, at the MD level that I think is, is corrected. So it's, it's basically just space that was kind of, you know, being used not very efficiently will now be used efficiently and as it happens, there's a terrific need, not, not just in Long Island, but really everywhere for sleep, sleep medicine. Got it, okay. And then I think this is my last question. Um, there was a chart you answered one of the ACA's, ACA's questions uh, would it, about the ratio of uh, commercial reimbursement and Medicare reimbursement. And I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the chart. If Medicare reimbursed $100 for a service, would it be accurate to say that your commercial payers reimbursed between $156 and $169? If you look at that chart. You can get back to me on that. But does that sound about right? That the ratio is about 156%? You know, it's, it's unique for um, critical access hospitals as well. You know, it, we don't we don't have fixed Medicare reimbursement, right? It's, it's, it's cost-based reimbursement. So what, what Medicare pays is not a fixed amount that, that really can be compared to what the commercials pay. Um, so I, I just used an average when I provided the chart. That no, was actually very helpful. And I'll be honest with you, it's on the lower end. So yeah. that's, that's helpful to us. But I want to make sure that, that my interpretation of that is. I'll get back to Ryan. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, you know, first of all, thank you for really framed kind of your story well and the situation that you're in. You know, and I'm also concerned about this hospital and you know where you've been. And 
ending up on their operating margins um, the past several years. And one thing I wanted to do is just kind of go back to last year's budget order to kind of ground a little bit because this situation is pretty similar. Um, which we said we're concerned the hospitals relying too much on commercial rate increase to address budgetary challenges to resolve ongoing financial concerns. Rather than considering other business changes such as finding expense reductions, implementing operational efficiencies to achieve a positive margin. And most importantly, is we're concerned about the hospital's sustainability and utilization continues to decline and expenses continue to exceed NPR. And really, if you can go back two slides to 23, you know, we're all bring the point, um, which is, you know, where you've been the past several years. Actually, that's no, the historical budget compliance. Um, and what's really concerning when I look back at your history, and I agree, you know, there's been some uh, commercial reductions that have been cut in the past. You know, I'd also say you're a hospital that's a little more favorably positioned than a lot of the other hospitals, and that you have about 60% of your revenue coming in from commercial um, insurance base. So when we take a 10% increase, you know, you get a large part of that um, hitting commercial increases more so than other hospitals go through because of your base is so large. But when I look at your history there, in 16, you actually exceeded um, your NPR by $1.8 million, yet when you go to your profit, you were actually unfavorable, 900000 When you go to 17, and I didn't have the expense numbers for 16 handy, so I'm going to switch to expenses, but in 17, you increased your NPR by 200000 and your expenses went up by 800000 In 18, you had a $1.8 million decrease in revenue, but your expenses went up 700000 In 19, you have a million and a half, you forecast a million and a half decrease in revenue with only a 600000 increase in expenses. And, and you know, that concern is that even in your forecast that you have for 20, if you don't hit the top line numbers, Irregardless of what we do with the commercial rate increase, you haven't been able to manage your expenses, even with all the cost reductions that you're doing, which are, I applaud all your efforts there. Um, you know, so to me, that's been really the biggest driver of your change. It hasn't necessarily been the commercial increases. That's certainly <coughs> aided to that. But once you went to budget, your expenses continue to be higher than utilization changes, even when you have favorable favorable increases on the top line. So I really want to challenge you on you know, how, how do you feel about the increase that you have in for 2020? You know, a large part of the growth, the six, six point increase year over year to where you're tracking, is pretty significant. You're falling a little bit short again on 19, you know, and when that happens, you're not able to change your expense load. So, we just want to get your point of view on how you feel about the forecast, what's going on with that, how can you get your expenses in line with where your trends really are for top line. Right. That can be something that's certainly challenging for an organization of, of our size. You know, we don't have the, the benefit of, of the scale that, say, a you know, kind of medical center would have in order to adjust up and down according to your volume. So we're a critical access hospital designation was really established to sort of recognize that we have limited ability to flex our expenditures when our volumes do go down. That's sort of the foundation of why a critical access designation was created to secure our financial stability because we have a high degree of fixed costs in the organization of our size. Um, I think we do an excellent job in terms of operational efficiency and trying to utilize the fixed capacity that we have, particularly in our, in our OR, as much as we can to help um, cover where we maybe don't, maybe where we are more challenged in terms of where we have low volume like in our ED or in our living center, our inpatient services. Um, it's a balancing act that we, that we do, but um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a challenge because there's gonna, there, there, there's a point in which you can't really go further down. Uh, an example being MRI. Um, we only have one MRI tech on, you know, in a day. 
there's only so far I could produce that, right? Um, and so you, you sort of come to that challenge of, uh, I, I will say, you know, for the organization that um, understanding our cost structure in each individual unit throughout the hospital is something that we do need to do a better job of. Um, we are limited by the technology that we're, we're using. I have the hope that some of the investments that we need to make on the capital side, and I think Jeff alluded to uh, a decision support system, um, something that we need to be investing in to help us dig a little deeper than we've been able to dig with the resources that we have to see, um, to do a better job of evaluating of the fixed cost, the step cost, and the variable cost. Um, yeah, that's really the big stuff that I have really budget is whether If it's not achieved, you can't really come back to expenses, like you said, because they are so fixed. And then it's this spiral of you continue to lose money at the bottom line. And you know, there's no answer to it. I just would challenge to make sure when you look through what your forecast is, you know, that we're not putting you know, too much weight on where you're gonna, what you're going to get. And that we really have looked at that utilization and that not to have. It's I think your point, your point is, is an excellent one, <coughs> uh, uh, and it's hard for me as the, as the interim guy with two and a half months on deck to, to answer comprehensively. <coughs> we have on Friday of this week and Monday of next week, the, our community is interviewing two CEO candidates. Uh, both are experienced, seasoned uh, CEOs with critical access hospital experience. Uh, both uh, bring, at looking at their resumes and from the feedback I've had from the interviews, I've not met either candidate during this process, but cost containment is stamped on my left forearm. Uh, in order to survive in healthcare for 46 and a half years. I understand the importance of the revenue side, but I have a high level of confidence. I, even though uh, the budget was adopted on my second day at, at Copley, I had seen four or five prior iterations. Having seen dozens of these budgets, uh, I, I, I have a a high level of confidence that we have, that we are, uh, we can under, we've under promised and we can over deliver. Uh, I think this is not pie in the sky uh, from my outside uh, point of view. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just 
wondering if you can speak to that um, because it's it's not something that's really in your control, but it's something that you have to live with. So I think one thing to consider is that the Coppin Hospital is a solely serving its, its local community. We, we do draw from outside of our service area quite a bit, uh, particularly in our orthopedic program, where we're drawing from, from Chittenden County. I, I think it, it's over half of that uh, program is coming from outside of our direct uh, primary service area. Uh, that tends to end up being commercial volume, not always. Thank you for as well. Um, I think that that has played a, a factor in that difference between how much commercial coffee has versus what, what our community demographic looks like, if that answers that piece of the question. Um, another factor in this, in this proposal is um, it does appear like a significant, in, not appear, it is a significant increase to the commercial payers in this particular year with the rate ask. However, our, our history, we, we've given them a significant amount, and the amount of our net revenue in FY20 that's actually being funded through rate changes is, is quite small, under 2%. I think that's a factor to consider as well. Um, I'm looking at uh, the bad death growth rate, growth rate over the last three years, and um, the food care um, growth rate and the bad debt growth rate has been 12.7% over the three-year period. And food care has been slightly negative at seven tenths of one percent. Um, and just the kind of current statistics are that the food care program is projected at 681,000 in uh, 2019, um, and uh, it's at 690,000 in um, 2017. And I'm just wondering, I've, I've listened to other hospitals as they try to manage the relationship between those two programs of kind of encouraging bad debt people to do their financial assistance um, uh, plans in order that they get some revenue out of it rather than writing off the bad debt. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that dynamic. Oh, absolutely. I, that's something that we definitely do at Copley as well. Can't really answer why it's not necessarily being reflected in the, in the result, but. Uh, I would even use the word push financial assistance pretty heavily at Copley. Um, any, any private pay patient is, is sort of cold call. <coughs> we review our, our bad debt before sending it off to a collection agency to um, identify folks to pursue, to reach out to. Um, but there, it is a process to apply for financial assistance um, that, that not everyone is, is willing to, to take on. And we do provide ample support for that. We'll fill out the application they can come and we'll fill it out with them. Um, we're encouraging them, of course, to um, apply for the exchange program during that process as well. Um, find out if they're eligible for Medicaid. We're, I think, have a very in intensive and involved and very supportive financial assistance program at Cobley. In fact, our financial counselor was named uh, Team Hero one month this year. I'm very proud of that. Uh, I'm, again, not sure why it's not necessarily reflected in growth in those numbers, but we, we push pretty hard. Um, my uh, next question basically has to do uh, with possible risk in, in terms of your utilization metrics. I noticed that from 2019 uh, projected over 2018 actual, that um, seven of the uh, um, utilization metrics were are negative and only two were positive, but that in your uh, projection from 2019 perspective to 2020, um, you have seven positive and two negative. And uh, I'm just wondering if you know, what kind of worry you might have that that transition from a, a negative trend in utilization to a essentially positive trend in utilization um, you know, might not unfold. So, we undergo um, quite a process when we project utilization at Copley where we're looking at historical trends. Um, that, that isn't always the, the singular approach that we take. Um, we also evaluate medical staff changes. That, that plays a pretty big role in, in some of those, those estimates. Um, folks who come and go. Um, 
folks who are new and are ramping up um, may have estimated their ramp up to happen a little faster than it did in reality. Those are things that we also factor in. But in average, you know, for the most part, we're trying to look at our, our actual utilization history and building those as estimates and then adjusting for the things that are known changes. Um, this particular budget cycle, I feel like we were pretty conservative with those projections, actually, um, based on, on the, the known changes that we, we have in our organization in terms of medical staff. Um, I'd, I'd say, you know, our FY19 budget was probably a little too aggressive. Um, and if you look year over year versus budget to budget, you may see a different trend um, of growth. Um, I feel pretty good about the, the realistic nature of the utilization assumptions. There are some I, I folks were saying they could do more, they could do more, and I said, let's, let's wait and uh, counter eggs when they or counter chickens when they hatch. Um, I prefer to take a more historical and local approach to that, and as I said, adjust for the whole staff changes or no or new service, new programs, for example, you know, this year are sleep study only. And my last question is, um, you know, you mentioned the uh, contract that you had for uh, pharmacy support agreement with the Mass State Psychiatric Hospital. The loss of that contract was a pretty big hit to your other operating revenue. I'm just wondering, how did that decision happen? What, what was the contract and what, why was it not um, renegotiated? Well, um, it was intended right from inception to be a temporary support agreement. But they're not in our backyard. Um, we, you know, it came out of the Hurricane Irene, and they, if you recall, set up a variety of um, local um, psychiatric care facilities. There was one placed in Morrisville, and that was when our support began. Um, we were right there down the street. We did more than pharmacy support for them. We provided a lot of a lot of other uh, support services, IT, linens. All, all, all the support services that we provide, but it was quite a bit more. And then when they moved to Barrie, um, the idea had been all along for, for them to be able to do these services, provide those services for themselves, and we just kind of been working with them slowly, um, eliminating, you know, <coughs> support services that we provided as they were able to, to take that on themselves. Um, so it's just, it was never intended to be a permanent thing. Uh, and, and with the other operating revenue did come expenses. It wasn't, it isn't the sort of a pass-through. Um, wasn't really something we were working in that's impacting our margin. Thank you. Robin? Thank you. Um, benefit to being later in the questioning because we have less questions. So that's kind of nice. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of uh, one or two of the wait times that you had reported in the spring as part of the non-financial uh, reporting that we collected. And in particular, I wanted to ask you about OB, because it looks like the wait times that on OB were on the high side compared to some of the other hospitals. Um, and I know that noticed in your narrative you mentioned that you're looking to increase your inventory support. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. the midwifery support. So um, our midwifery program in our community is very, very well respected. Um, I use them too. Um, and they're, they're, they're a, great, a great group of folks. Um, they were three full-time midwives and in this budget proposal um, in order to help solve some, some coverage challenges and, and some, some call coverage challenges we changed the model to four part-time midwives. And so it's, I think, a 0.6, if I recall correctly, um, increase in um, all total midwives in order to um, supply that coverage. A lot of it is, you know, has to do with the nature of their business and being called in in the middle of the night. And the call burden being spread amongst a reasonable amount of people in order to um, preserve their sanity and provide a high-quality service. Great, thank you. Uh, the other area that you were 
not actually unusually high compared to other folks' is cardiology, but it was a pretty high wait time. So do you have any thoughts on that as well? And again, we can get back to it. Cardiology in Copley is, is somewhat interesting as that it's certainly a, one of the you know, late stage bastions of general cardiology. We do echoes and stress tests and the ED and the floor and all other emergencies that come up and, and we have, one person does all that. Uh, and, you know, so, um, we did try. Uh, a model with a uh, physician assistant in the clinic, along with uh, along with Adam. Um, unfortunately, she left for uh, I don't know about greener, but other pastures. Um, that's almost certainly something we're going to look again uh, at some point. But, but unfortunately, uh, hiring another cardiologist is that would be probably more fantasy than than practical. You know, I might also comment that Adam Funan uh, was serving as a co-chief medical officer with Don Dupuy in this spring. He gave up that appointment, which both provided him with some of his time, was administrative time. He also served in a number of community activities. He is now focusing his time on his, on his clinical practice, and I, I suspect that that will have a positive impact on his availability. Oh, yeah. the, the other thing that, that happened about the time that those numbers went out is that uh, at Newport, they changed over from having their own cardiologist to being supported by, by Dartmouth. And uh, right at about that time, they, we were deluged with, with phone calls because it was a little uncertain for a while exactly what was, what was going on. And those numbers almost certainly reflect that, although I don't think they've gone down a whole lot since then. Uh, your slide on labor costs uh, with 4.7% of the rent, is there anything that you can break that down for us for um, how that uh, goes across like admin, um, docs, nurses, other staff? Not off the top of my head, no. Um. Uh, Kevin, what slide number is that your page? I think we have different numbers than you have. So. <laughs> there you go. That trend line, the 4.7 that I was talking about. No, you know, not off the top of my head. If that's something I could follow up on. So I mean, I don't think that our, our I wouldn't say our administrative costs are um, abnormally high at Copley. I believe you have a ratio that looks at, we're not doing that one anymore on overhead the percentage of your total operating expenses. And I may have to follow up with you on that, that question. That's you want more specificity. That'd be good. Um, there was some discussion on your uh, charge increase. And if you factor in the professional service charge, you're really at 8.5, correct? Can you talk to us about the methodology that you used um, to come up with that request? Yes. So the way we, we would normally go about this, um, we initially project our um, NPR trends without a rate in it. You know, look at our utilization, look at our pair mix, our bad debt, charity, et cetera. Uh, come up with our, our net revenue estimates first. Um, based on that history or based on those assumptions, um, changes in reimbursement, um, and also in the case of Medicare, our cost structure. Um, we go through a very laborious process on, on the, the cost side of the budget. It's a, not a top-down budget, but a bottom-up bottom budget. Every, every The budget starts at the department level and moves its way up instead of the other way around at Copley. Um, 
we take a look at the expenses that folks are proposing compared to that net revenue um, without a rate in it. Invariably, it's unreasonable when we need to go back two or three or four, some years five times to, to get those, those asks of on cost down. Once we feel we have pared down what we can out of those expense requests, um, we look at that remaining gap of our revenue and our, our expenses and determine what the difference would be to attain a 3% operating margin, which is, is really our, our goal, though we haven't been there. What that um, would equate to in a rate would be our ideal rate request at that point. However, you know, sometimes, like certainly in FY20, it would just be a ridiculous request. We simply can't, you know, get as far as three percent um, solely on those um, expense reductions and uh, rate requests. And so we went halfway there this year. That's a 1.4 percent operating margin, um, while keeping it under at least the overall three and a half percent cap. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of the logic of, of how we tend to set our overall top rate, um, our, gross, our gross, average change in gross charges. And then with the majority of our commercial agreements, their percent of charge, um, with the exception of Blue Cross, we have an outpatient fee schedule um, with them, uh, that, that generally models our um, change in charges though we do get together and negotiate that each year. Um, but professional fee schedules tend to, to be stagnant or um, controlled by the payer, not um, dependent on our charge request. So one of my concerns was um, you know, there were discussions about uh, trying to do an interim um, yeah. change in this, this current and uh, the carriers at least I believe they indicated to you that we were unlikely to get that. Are didn't you, outright say that, but yeah. Are you confident? based on the, the fact that they wouldn't be able to, it would essentially be that that um, it was late, I guess. insurance company yeah. footing the bill. It wouldn't be something that they could pass along in any possible <coughs> way to the premium payers and stuff. But realizing that um, what we do is really uh, cap and not Guarantee. Yep. Do you have any confidence that you'll be able to get and negotiate um, that uh, margin of an increase with the carriers? I hope to make a compelling case looking at that five year trend of what we've given back to them over the last four years. I'd really just like to get some of that. I'm going to make it compelling. I'm going to do my best. I, I, can't, I can't guarantee an outcome. Let's see, I'm sitting here in the back. <laughs> Okay, that's all the questions I have. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to the healthcare advocate, Julia. Thank you. Do you want me to use the microphone or is it okay? I just I as well. Probably okay. should okay. make sure. Just so people in the back can hear me. I think they're going to need yeah. to answer the um, question. I think we can try <laughs> the other one. Yeah. Okay. So you can have this one. And we'll bring back the other one. 